Welcome to episode number two of the STEMS of Grad School podcast. Today we have Karen Tang, who is a PhD student in clinical psychology at Dalhousie University in Canada. And the theme of today that we're going to be talking about is mental health in grad school. So to start off, would you be willing to kind of share your current position and kind of your career journey to how you got to that position? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, first off, for having me, Elena. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so essentially, um, I'm a second year student in the PhD clinical psychology program at Dahousie University in Halifax, Canada. So my research examines quite broadly, like behavioral addictions, like video gaming, gambling, um, as well as how these disorders correlate or associate with mental health and social factors, stigma and like cultural differences. Um, And I'm also a mental health and diversity advocate in higher education in terms of like, what was my career path like? I've kind of been all over the place. Like, I don't know how in depth you want me to go, but like. (laughs) Just like the highlights. Oh, just the highlights. I mean, I was like in kindergarten. I wanted (laughs) to be a zoologist. (laughs) Wow. That's, that's quite a trajectory to clinical psychologists. Yeah. Right. So like growing up, I've always loved animals. Like I've always wanted to work with animals as a carrier. Always wanted like have like a million pets. Um, so really, really loved animals. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, what if I become like a zoologist one day? How amazing would that be? Um, so that entire journey got completely derailed in high school where I took a single psychology class as an option. And I was like, oh my gosh, like you can study human beings. Like how interesting is that? And so I ended up um, applying for a Bachelor of Arts degree um in for undergrad and I did my undergrad at University of Calgary also in Canada um in psychology and I think somewhere along the lines I realized like clinical psychology was like the path for me so not only are you able to really help people which was I which I was really really passionate about but you also do research on the side Mm -hmm. which is also super interesting yeah so that's my journey in a broad nutshell (laughs) Yeah, and I mean, I guess, like, humans are animals, so, like, sort of ties in together, right? It does, it does, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so kind of going on the lines of your career journey, what has been your kind of mental health journey and through grad school, and, like, you can just kind of touch on what you want to touch on there. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a that's a very, like, eye-opening and, like, introspective journey um, <laughs> that I've been on. And I've, I'm only in, like, year two of grad school, so we're going to see where we end up. <laughs> but essentially, um, so I started grad school in September of 2019, so this was, like, before COVID hit. Um, but sometime around March 2020, so, like, right before COVID hit, I had to deal with like a massive bout of like I think burnout and I think it all accumulated to like one day um, I remember super clearly it's in March uh, we were in class um, practicing like doing interviews with clients and things like that so I was sitting across from one of my cohort mates and I was acting as a therapist and she was a client and we also had a student supervisor on the side kind of like supervising us and there were cameras in the room because our professor was essentially supervising us via the cameras sitting in another okay. room <laughs> so that's kind of like the setting um and this was like around like 3 p.m i mean like probably like on a tuesday and as a therapist you think that you're in control um for most of the sessions so i was trying to like handle myself like professionally um like this was essentially like reenacting how you might like see a client for the first time. Mm-hmm. So during this like role playing session, um, for some reason, I <laughs> ended up having like a panic attack. And at oh, no. first, I didn't know it was a panic attack. I thought I was having a complete nervous breakdown. So <laughs> yeah, this is my journey. Um, so it was it's kind of hard to describe if you've never had a panic attack, but I find symptoms tend to be um, 
where you feel like you have like an elephant sitting on your chest. So it's really, mm -hmm. really hard to breathe. So you're kind of like floundering like a fish out of water. So you're mm -hmm. gasping um, a lot. Your heart is racing, really. Um, and I was like sobbing uncontrollably because I don't know what was happening, right? <laughs> I was like, I can't breathe. Why am I crying? Oh yeah. my gosh, what is happening to me, right? So yeah, so I had like a panic attack in the middle of the class, not a fun time. And I was lucky enough to have like really supportive like classmates to like yeah. comfort me. And they're like, okay, like, what do you need right now? How can I take care of you? Like, just let us know what you need. Um, and so I was like, I like, I don't know. I'm like still sobbing. I'm like, I don't know. I'm crying. I don't know. Like I can't breathe. And it's like dying. I don't know. <laughs> like there's so many thoughts that are going through your head. Yeah, like, yeah. like I, I don't know what's happening. So, um, so I took like a bit of a break. I went to like, the bathroom, splashed some water on my face. And I was like, okay, I can do this. Went back into the room again, trying to be that therapist. <laughs> and then again, completely broke down. And I was like, okay, I can't do this today. And my professor came in and she was like, Karen, are you sure you don't want to just like, take the rest of the day off? Like, please just go home, just recuperate. And I was like, okay, yeah, I think I, think I need it. Um, so I was like walking home and I was still crying. <laughs> and I had strangers like look at my face and I was like, I don't know why I'm crying. Like, and so this was like, I'm laughing now. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's like you're laughing now. You were laughing then. I was not. I was like <laughs> sobbing. And I was like, oh my God, I just had like a nervous breakdown in class. Oh my gosh. Um, but I was really lucky in that I was able to call like my friends and family back home and like let them yeah. know. I am like struggling right now. Could you like, please like sit with me on the phone? Can we like hash things out? Um, because I had moved essentially across the country um, okay. to go to grad school here. So it has been a really, it had been a really isolating experience. Um, but I was very, very um, lucky to have really supportive classmates, that professor, as well as like friends and family to support me. Um, and yeah, and so didn't realize that nervous breakdown I had was actually a panic attack. And so reflecting now, I realized I've had multiple instances of panic attacks throughout my life. This had never labeled it or realized right. there was a panic attack. So it was not only very eye opening um, as like a mental health clinician where you're like, oh, I do experience like certain panic attack symptoms, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you also have that um, that lived experience now as a clinician. And you're like, oh, I can really relate to my clients that really go through things like panic attacks on like a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's like hard for someone who's like going to therapy to like realize that that therapist is a human being too that may have their own things they're working through and you're like, okay, that person, like that person's good. Like, right. Cause, cause they're teaching you how to be good. So they, and it's like realizing that everyone's kind of human sometimes is like Absolutely. really important and giving, you know, your, your therapist grace. Cause I'm sure trying to deal with listening to everything people are working through is probably like, it, it's a lot on them. Like I couldn't imagine, like I couldn't, I could not be a therapist. I could not take all of that on. Cause I would just be, but yeah, like, I feel like it's like helpful in one way maybe cause you can actually connect with what they're feeling. But then I feel like it's also, I don't know, like, I don't know. Yeah, I think you brought up like a really good point. Like it's important to remember, like as a therapist, we are human. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's about bringing that like experience in life as well as like potentially like that life experience if you have dealt with mental health struggles, mm -hmm. as well as being trained with like mental health and like evidence-based treatment that we really can provide like the help we need. But yeah, it's a lot about um, like as a therapist and as a client, just being really compassionate towards yourself because we all go through mental health struggles. And so it really is quite like the mental health journey. Yeah. Um, 
what, I guess, however much you feel comfortable with sharing, but like when you recognized what was happening and you, you said that you like called your friends, but what were the steps that you took like after that day? Like, because you said that it was like kind of a combination of like burnout and like a lot going on. So what did you start doing after that, that has led you to now where you seem not in panic mode? (laughs) I mean, sometimes we still, we still hit sometimes. Right, right. (laughs) There's like, I find burnout is such a hard thing to like tackle because it's such a, uh, it's hard to describe what burnout is like. Um, But I guess, so we can define burnout. So academic burnout, which I think was what I was experiencing can be defined as like a negative emotional, physical and mental reaction to like prolonged study for academics that really results in like exhaustion, frustration, lack of motivation, and like a reduced ability in academics or school. Um, and in terms of like how I actually got to like where I'm at a space where I can talk more openly about like my experience with like panic attacks and like mm-hmm. mental health, it has been a very, very long journey. And I've had to be really, really compassionate with myself and um, it has not been like easy. <laughs> um, I like I remember like I didn't want to talk to my family about it for I think like two weeks. Like they had no idea this was going on. Like the friends I had called were like my closest best friend, right? Who I've known for like six to eight years. Like we've been through a lot, and they were the people I really wanted to call first. Um, so I think I called my brother, um, really fortunate to have him. And I, I called him and I was like sobbing. I was like, I don't know what's happening. And he's like, what's happening? Like, he was like, <laughs> I think he was transiting to go to school or something. And he's like, are you okay? Like, do you want me to like buy a plane ticket so you can fly back? Oh. Like that day, I know. And I was like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> um, so it was a lot of... I found for me, it was a lot of talking through what had happened okay. first and like talking about like my emotions and like or, my thoughts and what like I was feeling in that moment and then talking to some of my cohort mates and then That's realizing cool. that, oh, hey, it was a panic attack. And once I had been able to like actually find like a label for it, mm-hmm. it was almost like empowering. Um, in a way that you're like, oh, so these symptoms I've always tend to experienced when I was in high pressure situations, even as like a kid growing up, there's actually, this is, this is like a panic attack. Mm -hmm. Um, And so not only has it like empowered me to know, like, this is what I now deal with. This is part of my like life story. Um, it has also allowed me to really like talk about it. It, it hasn't, I, I don't like the first like couple months, I really didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> um, I didn't even want to like write down my thoughts. Um, but then I had reached out to the voices of academia team. Yeah. And then through them, I was like, okay, I think I'm ready to like, type out my experiences, not necessarily speak about them verbally yet, but like maybe type it out in the form of a blog. And that, that was really, really hard (laughs) trying to like convey like all my emotions, all my thoughts, all those like physical sensations I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. But I found once I had typed that all up, it was almost like releasing in a way because yeah, I had a vision that if I could at least help one person through that blog, like indirectly, I think like sharing my experience would be considered like it would have been worth it. Yeah. Speak out. Yeah. It's kind of a, an interesting kind of trajectory because you're also like kind of surrounded by like psychologists or training psychologists. So it's like, how, and then being able to like talk about things and writing about things. Um, And I know, like, just from like my own experience, when I was in, when, when I was in high school, um, I went to a boarding school, and my roommate wrote a suicide note. 
Um, and I found it and she was okay because like we got, but like I was in not a good mental state. Like I didn't know how to react to this whole situation. And one thing someone encouraged me to do was to write a letter to her. Cause like, I felt like, even though it was like good and that people got to her and she was ended up being okay. Like I found it by like going through, well, it wasn't really going through her stuff, but like she had put the note like on her desk and I felt like, and I had opened, I was like, something's just not right about this. So I opened, it was like on top of all of her books. And so I opened it up and I was like, and then I realized what it was, but like, I felt bad because I had gone through her stuff and like, I like, couldn't, I, it's just, I couldn't like handle, like I was like 18 at the time. I couldn't handle all the things happening, but I found that like, after I, I wrote it out, even though that was really hard, it was like, I was a much like better mentally. These are not good words, but yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting how, like, I mean, first off, I'm sorry you had to go through that. That must have been, like, quite the experience. <laughs> like, at 18, oh my goodness, I can't imagine. But, like, kudos to you for, like, it, you were very courageous and brave, and, like, you spoke up and got help for your friend, which I think is really important. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And, but yeah, it's really interesting. I guess there's, like, different ways that we can like talk about or express like our feelings emotions yeah. and thoughts and things like that right and if, if if writing about it or like a love letter to like perhaps your friend or like yeah. my, like if I were to write like a love letter to myself I think like <laughs> it sounds weird but like yeah. in like a compassionate and kind way to really acknowledge like the struggles that you're really going through mm-hmm. I think that could be like something to really take away from yeah yeah. So I don't know if you you know much about this, but do you know like if other graduate students are struggling with mental health, do you know what kind of resources that could be available for them um, as their how to like kind of get out of that or will not get out of that, but to be able to kind of come through the other side and do you know about any resources available? Yeah, so in terms of resources to like help cope with like mental health struggles, <laughs> I can't really think of that many off the top of my head, which I think highlights like major gap in this area. Yeah. Um, so the ones that I am aware of, because I'm currently always lurking on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Is Dragonfly Mental Health. So they're a nonprofit organization really created to improve mental health care access and really address the unhealthy culture that's currently like pervasive in academia. So I do know they've really fostered a community of academics and they tend to host a multiple multitude of like events and workshops that are tailored towards grad students as well as academic acad- academics. Yeah, <laughs> like faculty members. Um, so I think they also have a podcast too. I'm not quite sure. I think you're right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you what the name of it is, but I, I think they do have something like a podcast going on. Yeah. Um. Actually, that brings to mind, I think it's PhD Balance. Yes. That was the other which, one I was thinking Which about. is, okay. They have a podcast. Yes. But I'm not sure if they're affiliated. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not something to look into. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, And then I've already mentioned Voices of Academia. Mm -hmm. So they're a blog and I think they're now also a podcast that bring together the voices of academics across the globe to really discuss mental health and well-being in academia. And so I've already disclosed that I've previously worked with them to publish a blog on my experience with like panic attack symptoms Mm -hmm. so they've really been a joy to work with and I worked with co-founders so Zoe and Marissa and they really helped me find like my mental health advocacy voice and yeah it has actually really been like I say empowering all the time but it was really helpful to really get that out across Mm -hmm. get that out into the world um and now I kind of like talk about it a lot now (laughs) Which is good because we we need <clears throat> we need people to to like talk about it and help 
Because as you get things more normalized, they become destigmatized. And so helping people to, especially grad students, to recognize symptoms of things and then say, okay, I, I need to make a pivot because I'm, I'm going in a downward spiral and I need to exit now instead of exiting when I, you know, hit rock bottom. Exactly. So like recognizing signs of like burnout, for example, mm-hmm. you really do need to like pivot. Like I hope nobody ever hits that point of burnout, but I know a lot of us grad students do. Mm-hmm. So it's really, again, like trying to like minimize stigma and like destigmatize talking about mental health. Um, absolutely. But those are like the two or three resources I can think of off the top of my head. I don't yeah. know if you have any. Those were, I was also thinking, um, I can't remember her last name right now, but Zoe's, Dr. Zoe uh, Twitter account. She posts a lot of, of things um, and I can have that that linked below. Um, I'll, I'll add hers in. Um, but yeah, she posts a lot of things that I see and she's also a chemist, which I'm a chemist. So I was like, oh, cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I follow her account. I'm trying to think of other specific people. I don't know if Thrive PhD, uh, Katie Peplin. Have you heard of her? I have, yes. I don't know if she has kind of resources um, for mental health. I know she has it for like a few other things, but she's also pretty, she has really good stuff on her thing too. Um, But yeah, there definitely does need to be more. I do love how like the academic space is now starting to get kind of people coming out, creating businesses that are meant to help graduate students with like the things their advisors don't teach them and things like to connect them with different experiences. Like there's academic YouTube and there's like, uh, I mean, obviously this channel's on academic YouTube, but there's so many, you know, people who are now like Dr. Toy and Ali and just so many different things that you can now get help with that you could, like, I didn't know that I didn't, I, I got on academic Twitter after I was already out of grad school. So it's like, I didn't even know about any of this, like when I was actually a grad student. Um, so yeah, I think hopefully in the future, you know, there will be a greater number of resources but I, yeah I agree with those three are kind of the three main that come to my mind as well just being on academic Twitter yeah academic Twitter is fantastic yes. this is like not the point of like today's like episode but academic Twitter amazing I think there's a lot of like individuals there um, I can't really <laughs> name any off the top of my head because I'm under pressure right now <laughs> yeah no, 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 you're good. um Yeah, I think there are, and like even like my account, I think every, I like, I schedule out tweets, of course, because, you know, I'm busy. Um, So like every Saturday morning, I have a mental health tip that I I always schedule out. And usually it's something about, you know, giving yourself permission to take time on the weekend, you know, because that was something that I, it, it took me three years to learn that it's okay to treat your like schooling your degree as a job, like instead of treating it as this is who you are, you know? And so learning, so that's why, you know, I even kind of tweet out, you know, mental health stuff, just because I think it is so important. So even if it's not an account really dedicated to that, I think there's a lot of people out there that are either willing to give support if you're going through something or kind of tweet out tips or tricks or I don't know if there's really tricks to mental health, but like tips and advice. There we go. That's the, that's the better word um, for kind of scaling, you know, dealing with mental health. Yeah, for sure. Which is awesome. Like I love just going on academic Twitter and then seeing everyone's like tips and tricks that we could take away from like what self-care activities or strategies that everyone's like engaging in. And you're like, Oh yeah, I try this one. And then I save it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, who am I thinking of? I'm thinking of, um, ah, uh, Dr. Liz Faber. She's literature. I think I don't she's think in I English know. or literature, but she, every day I think says, this is what self-care looked like today. Um, how did your self-care look like? And so, yeah, she, she's also someone that's kind of fun to follow. That's awesome. Yeah. I love those like physical reminders you get and you're mm-hmm. like, you know what? I did not do self-care today. I'm just going to schedule it in for the yep. evening. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. So now that you've, that, that you've kind of gone through being burnt out, how do you prevent getting to that point again? So what steps or mechanisms do you have in place to not get burnt out again? Fingers crossed. It doesn't happen again. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, definitely. Um, so it has been quite the process for sure. So it was a lot of like reassessing like my values and my intentions Mm -hmm. and like career goals. Like I was in first year, so I really wasn't expecting to hit the point of burnout in my first year of grad school. (laughs) And I did. And so it was very eye opening for me in terms of like, I like, hadn't realized up till like March, I had been working basically every day, Mm -hmm. nonstop, Mm -hmm. including weekends. Like I had been working evenings. I had been working weekends and I was like, this is not for me. I need to take like evenings and weekends off. And that's what I do now. I take as many evenings off as possible, take as many weekends off as possible. Um, so it's a lot about like reassessing like my values and things like that. And I had realized also that it was really isolating because I hadn't really gone out with friends too much because again, first year grad school was really hard. Mm-hmm. And I had just moved across the country. So realizing like, oh my gosh, I really value like spending time with like friends that I had to really start like purposefully scheduling in like mm-hmm coffee dates with friends or like just like a walk by the water with friends things like that um so it was all I guess a process of developing what I would call like a self-care toolkit um so really self-care toolkit it's like developing like strategies that really work for you that are like personalized to you again based on like your values your lifestyle Um, And so that was really vital to really ensure that like when or if I ever do hit that point of burnout again, Mm -hmm. I can really draw on these strategies to pull me back. But again, it's ideal that you never hit that point of like burnout. So like don't want to hit that point of physical, emotional fatigue. So I like I'm a really big proponent of using at least like one self-care strategy each week or even like daily to prevent burnout. Um, So for example, I tend to turn off my phone an hour before bed so I could read like a paperback novel. Um, I find that how that's what helps me like wind down for the day. Um, Things like that. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's really interesting. Do you, have you ever like put together like a PDF of your, your self-care? I love the like self-care toolkit, like thing. I, I think that would be so cool just to like put together a PDF and be like, here's your self-care toolkit. <clears throat> Come get oh one. <laughs> I love that. I would, I, I don't have like a PDF. I have like a mental list. So this is what I do with my life. I do mm. have a bunch of like metaphysical mental lists in my brain of like the movies I want to watch or like, the self-care strategies I draw on. So I don't have like a written out list. Although I think I did see on Twitter that some individuals had made like a self-care of like toolkit, like an actual box. Oh, of, like, things that they like there's like paint brushes inside or like a mm. journal so if they ever wanted to like use anything they just go to their toolkit and they open it and they take something out and it sounds like amazing so I this is tangential but on that topic if you and you don't have to answer but I, I would also answer it if you had a box what would be in it Oh, I love that question. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is like diving into like my hobbies now. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think a big, big thing for me would be like a bunch of books. <laughs> like okay. I love, I love like reading for pleasure. So like no textbooks. <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe a couple of like random books on like psychology. That would be fun. Um, but like a lot of books I would love to read all the books in the world (laughs) but yeah um painting so I am a really big painter um so I would have like a bunch of canvases and like paint brushes Mm -hmm. I'd also have like um 
I don't know, like face masks, because those are fun to do sometimes. I've never done one. Oh my God, really? Yeah. <laughs> we should do one sometime. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Oh, and that coloring books. Oh my God. Like adult coloring. Yes. Really, I love it so much. It is so soothing. <laughs> I do. I do have a few coloring books. Yeah. Um, be primarily what would be in mine although like anything artsy or crafty Mm -hmm. definitely down (laughs) what about you so I think mine would be wine oh (laughs) wine is my go-to self-care thing um puzzles I'm a big puzzler Mm -hmm. um and then I so I have I have a kindle instead of like actual I do prefer paperbacks but I don't have the money for paperbacks (laughs) So, um, I, I'll do like the, the like Kindle short reads. So like books that are less than a hundred pages and I can read in like two hours. Um, cause I'll tend to forget like what happened before. If, cause like sometimes it's a while till I can get back. So just to be able to like take two hours to myself with like, usually I go through about two glasses of wine and a book, you know, it's a, oh, that sounds it's, lovely. It does. <laughs> um, and then maybe like some bath bombs. Cause I, I enjoy oh. baths. Oh my gosh. I, I actually have a bathtub now in my apartment. I've never done like a bath bomb. I really need to. Okay. So I need to try bath bombs. And, you <laughs> and need I need to try, to try face masks. masks. <laughs> All right. to reconnect. <laughs> I actually I have face masks I got oh. like I was like I'm gonna have a spa day yes you are four months ago oh my gosh. So I bought face masks for my spa day and they are still sitting in my bathroom unused so we know what exactly you're gonna do yes I will this self-care. weekend I'm gonna <laughs> try the face masks nice so. nice um, I did want to touch on something that you said earlier, because you were you were talking about how you were like, I guess, surprised that you were in your first year and you were burnt out. And I, I to me, that's not surprising at all. Oh. Um, because especially so if you're like me or I feel like a, potentially a lot of people, when you go into grad school, you're told that it's, it's different and it's harder and there's so many more things you have to do. And so you go in with the mindset of, I have to be on it. I have to do grad school all the time to be successful because everyone's telling me how hard it is. And then there's all these different things that you have to do. So like in my case, you have courses, you have teaching and you have research are kind of the big things. Um, I'm sure it's different when you're not in a chemistry program. (laughs) But so like you have all these different things you have to do. And you're like trying to go in and balance all these things. But a lot of people don't actually take the step back and say, okay, my first semester, I'm not going to try and be a superstar in anything. I'm just going to learn how to balance everything. And most people go in and they're like, okay, I need to get my first paper done this semester or like really ridiculous, like notions. And so they're not even, they, they, they're not even taking the time to balance everything. So they feel behind on everything. And then they're trying to get ahead on everything. And like, I feel like that is just a recipe to like burn out in your first year versus when you're later in your grad school career, you've learned to balance the things, or at least hopefully you've kind of learned what's expected of you each week on things. And you're kind of more in the flow and you like get stress points for sure. But I feel like that first year learning to just give yourself grace and being like, you do not have to be excellent at all the things in this moment. Yeah. I think so. I did have that like mentality. I went in and I was like, I got to do X, Y, Z. I got to publish. I got to do research. I have like five courses. Um, yeah. And it was a lot. (laughs) I didn't realize like grad school is fantastic in that you'll you'll get so many new opportunities at the same time I think I I said yes to way too many things yeah so it's a lot about learning to say no um, mm-hmm. and it's, it's not the end of the world if you say no to your supervisor they will understand yeah um, so it's a lot of learning to like juggle all these different balls mm-hmm. right and an analogy I tend to use a lot is grad school. It's all about learning how to juggle all these different responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Sometimes 
well, a lot of the times for me, I tend to drop one of those balls because <laughs> you've got so many things going on, right? So it's learning to drop like which balls are okay, they're mm-hmm. rubber, so you drop them, it bounces back up, you'll be fine versus learning which ones are glass. So those are like the things that you cannot drop, right? If they drop, they're going to shatter. That's not a good mm-hmm. thing. So it has been like quite a process just to learn how I can handle things when I'm under stress. Mm-hmm. Uh, what responsibilities can I let go for a little bit while I focus on my high pro- priority items? So it's definitely a learning experience. Um, and yeah, I, I can understand why I hit burnout too in my first year. Uh, it was because I had also like did my undergrad in four years and then went directly to grad school. Mm-hmm. So I didn't really have like a gap year. And I really wish if I could tell my younger self is to like either take that entire summer off before grad school or take like a year to really like recharge my battery. Yeah, I um I also did the same thing. I did grad school in four years. Um and then I graduated May 22nd and June 1st I started grad school. I did undergrad in four years. Did I say grad school? No. Yeah. I did undergrad. I did undergrad in four years, and then like within eight days of graduating, oh my I gosh. <laughs> moved across the country. Well, halfway across the country, and started um, grad school. And then when I graduated from grad school, I like started my postdoc the next week. And now, I mean, now I, I'm like just doing my business. Like I, I just quit everything. I was like, I can't handle it at all anymore. Um, so it's like now this is like kind of a gap year for me. Like, I don't know if it's like something I'm going to do full time or, or if I'm just going to take a pause, but I think having a gap year and realizing that taking time for yourself is not going to kill your future, um, is so important. And it's also like you brought up a really good point about how like you really need to take care of yourself first, right? Like that quote, you really, you can't pour from an empty Mm -hmm. cup. You really need to take care of yourself first before you can like begin to help others like as a therapist or through your teaching or through your Mm -hmm. research. Yeah, it's like, like, I loved your analogy with like the different balls, but like realizing, because I think we think of like our, our expectations as the, our different responsibilities, but like realizing one of the balls is you and you are glass. Like you can't drop yourself, which I feel like is what we do. We're like, no, we got to focus on grad school. And then we're just like, like, I feel like I'm only now really learning how to like take care of myself and learning how to be happy in like my current state, rather than always thinking, you know, when the next thing comes along, it's going to make me happy and like learning how to be happy just in your crappiest situation will guarantee your happiness in your best situations, right? Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. And it sounds like a lot of us tend to be very like future oriented Mm -hmm. or future focused, right? So I've also been doing a lot of mindfulness in terms of like self-care strategies. So really learning to be like present focused in the moment and being very uh, non-judgmental. Right. And like, I think I came across like a post on Twitter about how like your past self would have loved to be in the position you are now. Like Mm -hmm. just, you got to remind yourself that this is like something I've been really striving to, or like a career goal or a dream I've been striving to. And like, you're here right now. So it's really, you really got to like enjoy the moment and realize like past you would have been so, so proud of you. Yeah. Even though right now it it might feel like, like the worst point (laughs) you're you're at rock bottom but really you've come so far Um, yeah something to keep in mind yeah I think that's that's really important yeah to to reflect on how far you've actually come because you may not feel like you've come far at all so kind of talking about your daily life you know how in your like What does your schedule, like daily schedule look like? And how do you try and protect your mental health? Like what structures do you put in place in your day to do that? Yeah. So this is always a fun question. because So I tend to like, I I don't know. I feel like I'm kind of like a grandma for some reason. So I wake up really, really early. Okay. (laughs) So 
I, I don't know. My body is like, Karen, you need to be up. And I'm like, I am trying to sleep in. <laughs> so I get up at like, whatever, uh, like 5.45 or something. Okay. And then I go, and then get this, I go for a 6 a.m. run. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Which is mind blowing for some, um, but like I really enjoy running, so I think like yeah. activity is another one of my like self care strategies. Um, so I go run for, at six a.m. Go by the ocean, get to enjoy like some rise. Um, some I'm snacks. sure that's beautiful. <laughs> oh, it is, and it's like there's like it's so peaceful. There's like no one around. Yeah. <laughs> so. Get my run done. I always grab breakfast. I think it's really important to like eat breakfast. That's how I get started. Um, then I like tend to write for an hour because I always have like research papers or like okay. assignments on the go. So I kind of do like the Pomodoro technique, but like for okay. one hour um, because I tend to get really, really focused on one thing. So if mm-hmm. I tend to take like a 25 minute Pomodoro and then I take a five minute break it just doesn't work for me (laughs) so it's like time blocking it is time blocking yeah I think that's a better term yeah (laughs) I got you yes okay so yeah so I write for like a dedicated hour and then I tend to have classes so I have like okay class and then I've got like a bunch of meetings throughout so anytime I'm not in a meeting probably be working on like assignments or research Mm -hmm. and then I think I tend to get tired around like 4 p.m. <laughs> so I tend to do like easy tasks. So like emailing, I might leave for like 4 p.m., 5 mm-hmm. p.m., eat dinner quite early at like 5.30. <laughs> and then that dinner to me is almost like a signal for like a wind down period. Yeah. So I don't really do any work after I have dinner. Okay. So I might spend that evening like, watching Netflix or Disney plus and then I tend to this is like a very like long day um but I then I tend to like turn off my phone for like the last hour and then just read a book in bed um so I find that in terms of protecting my mental health it's really important to like protect my peace by really, again, not working evenings and weekends as much as possible, Mm -hmm. which I find my my supervisor finds this really mind blowing because he's always like, Karen, you really need to like take care of yourself and your mental health, like engage Mm -hmm. in self-care. Every time I'm like, I take evenings and weekends off. And he's like, what? (laughs) Yeah, I think, I think it's kind of funny. Um, like that it, he finds it, you know, mind blowing. Cause I think when people think that if you take time off and you take time for yourself, you're going to be less productive, but in actually you tend to be much more productive because you're actually motivated to get stuff done for one, because you're like, Oh, I get the evening off. I just got to get this done today. And then like for two, you're actually excited about what you're doing instead of hating it. So you don't put things off as much. And especially if you can like learn to like get in the zone and like focus like you do for writing. Um, I think you you actually become much more productive if you're happier and you're enjoying what you're doing and you're not burnt out. Um, where I think people like my advisor in grad school thought that I never slept and I <laughs> slept like 10 to 12 hours a night. Like I was really bad. I sleep so much. Um, but he thought I never slept. And I was just like, no, I really do. Um, but like just learning, you know, kind of, that being successful doesn't mean giving up your mental health or giving up your life. Absolutely. So I think again, like reevaluating like my values, I realized like one of my non-negotiables is like mental health Mm -hmm. and sleep. It's like sleep ties into that so much. Like I've honestly never in my entire life pulled an all nighter because I just, I can't compromise my sleep. I really can't. Mm -hmm. Um, So I always try to get like seven to eight hours of sleep. And I think that's mind boggling for some people in my program. Cause I know there are some people in my program who pull all nighters before presentations for them. It might work for them, but it really doesn't work for me. Yeah. So again, really knowing yourself and like tailoring your self-care plan to you is so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I think 
Yeah, I sleep way too much. I'm like trying, like I'm trying to get my sleep down to eight hours because I sleep. I, I mean, if I'm just like left alone, I'll sleep for 14 hours straight, which is I mean, probably not good. If you're recharging, that's how you recharge. You do you. <laughs> well, it's like I'm still tired when I wake up. Oh, so, so I like think like- I'm oversleeping. Yeah, that's the thing. I'm trying to figure out like my optimal too right now. And it's, yeah. it's all over the place. Well, like I actually, so I, there's like a, a sleep cycle alarm clock. I don't know if you've heard of it, but like it like detects when you're in your lighter stage of sleep. Um, so it'll, it'll wait until you're, so you like set like a time frame for it to wake you up. And so you can set like seven o'clock and then give it a 30 minute window. So from 6.30 to seven o'clock, it'll find when you're in your lightest stage of sleep and then then set the alarm to go off. And I'm like, and it's been working really well because it's like, I'm not as tired when I wake up because it's like a more natural wake up than like me being in a dream. And then the alarm clock sound is in my dream. And now I'm wondering why there's this weird sound going on, you know? So like using even something like that to try and, and again, like I'm only scaling myself back to like seven or eight hours. (laughs) It's not like I'm like three hours of sleep. Let's go. I'm like, no. So then I guess we've kind of touched on this quite a few times, but like if you could give like one or two top tips for graduate students to implement in order to uh, maintaining or protecting their mental mental health through grad school, uh, what would those be? Yeah, so I think to re- reiterate some of my previous points, I think it's super important to like regularly, I mean, regularly engage in self care. Mm-hmm. Um, I know we tend to use like self care as like a buzzword, but like I think it's really, really important to continuously engage in self care. So, again, that could be like a dedicated time during your week, such as taking like your weekends completely off. It could be like a physically distanced, like coffee chat with friends. I know like the weather or summer is coming out now. And like the past summer we had like physically distanced, like picnics with friends across like oh. the lot. And it was like lovely. <laughs> so really being very explicit and like purposely blocking time off, like in your agenda to really engage in self-care regularly really allows you to develop self-care as almost like a habit so at, at the first the first few times you're doing self-care, it might seem like a tedious and like a bit monotonous. And you're like, why am I doing this? Um, but like, take it from me as someone who really had to like hit the point of like burnout to realize self-care is so, so important. And so you're like a color coder like I am. And then so I tend to actually highlight like in bright colors my self-care activity for the week. So it's like something to really look forward to, right? Yeah. Like that yeah. coffee chat with a friend. And then another tip I think I had to really take away from my experience is to really seek out like a peer support network. Okay. So find those who can really relate to or even are going through the same things as you are as a grad student. Um, again, you really can't do this alone. And that's what I learned, like moving across the country. Um, so you got to really rely on your network. So that could be other grad students um, to really help you feel supported. Like family can be fantastic and well-meaning, but sometimes they don't really understand mm-hmm. what you're going through, like especially because I'm a first generation um, grad student. So this is like a little tangential, but like I was speaking to one of my cousin-in-laws this past summer. Um, he was asking me like, oh, did you publish anything new recently? And I was like, yeah, I published like a couple of new papers and like with the most serious look on his face, he's like, oh, so did you, did you get paid to publish? And I was like, oh, this is so cute. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. I had to pay the journal to publish my work. <laughs> yeah. Um, so really, uh, family might not really understand like the nuances of academia and that's okay too. Mm-hmm. But on like the flip side, I will say to really seek out individuals who also aren't in academia. Um, I find that like my non-academic friends are actually so much more supportive and they're amazing cheerleaders, right? Because they're like, oh my gosh, you published an article, like even this third author, that is amazing. Yeah. Or yeah. you did like you presented at a conference, like how like amazing or fantastic is that? 
Um, so as a good friend says, it, like, it really does depend on your frame of reference. Mm-hmm. So like, depending on like, if you are immersed in academia or if you're not, it can really change how you view your accomplishments and things like that. So again, just finding like a peer support network of like friends, family, and like academic and non-academic, non-academic friends is super important. Yeah, I, I, most of my friends are in like, even from like college or like went into grad school. So it's like kind of funny. Um, but like my, my partner is non-academic. Um, he's an engineer. So it's like having those two perspectives, because I think academia can sometimes get fairly competitive, even if you're trying your best not to be competitive, it can get like that. So to have like an outside perspective, instead of people that are like, it's kind of invested in you not doing as well, or at least not doing that much better than them, Um, which is like sad. And like, I'm even very competitive, but like, I work very hard to make sure when I talk to another person, I don't let that come out. And that's something that I have to work on. I'm trying to become less competitive, but something I'm working on. So um, I guess kind of one of my last questions, because I think a lot of there, I think there's like two camps of grad students. Like some are like, I will probably three camps. Some know they need to like focus on their mental health and like actually do it like you and, and are, are rocking it. Some are like, I feel like I need like to focus on myself or I need time to myself, but I don't know how to do it. And then there's another camp that's like, no, I just have to keep working all the time. And like, that's, what's important. So to like those, that third group of people, why, why is it so important to take time and focus on your mental health while you're in graduate school? Yeah. So a way I like to think of it is like, when we talk about like well-being, we often think about like the physical side of things. Mm-hmm. So like physical health, like you need to see a doctor regularly, like for a yearly checkup we tend to really neglect like the mental health side of things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important to like, remember. So to keep in mind, like really keep in mind that mental health and wellness is really like a continuous and like lifelong journey. And it's really idiosyncratic to each of us, just like our fingerprints. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to like, consider that when we talk about like well-being and like achieving your full potential, that mental health is also a huge component of it. So I think it's okay to be like hesitant and not sure where to start. There's a lot of things you could do that can help you. And I think it's just trying to get yourself out there and try these different things. Like for you, it might be bath bombs. For me, it might be like face mask. Cause yeah. that's totally okay. It's, it's all about like, I guess, learning more about who you are and Mm -hmm. like what really resonates with you and yeah just really ensuring you have self-care strategies at the ready will really allow you to draw on them when your battery is really repleted yeah and I think as a component of that and I don't know how you view this you could probably tell me I'm wrong um but like self-care can also kind of be personal development Um, so you can like, so one thing I've done kind of recently is in my self-care time, I was like, oh, I'm going to start writing. Um, and then I was like, I started writing on, on medium. I don't know if you know about it. Um, but yeah, it's like basically a place where you can actually make money writing. And then I was like, oh, I'm pretty good at this. I'm going to keep doing it. Um, so it's like recog- like learning new things about yourself. And if you don't take that time, you only ever have your identity in graduate school or in your, your job, instead of having like me, I'm, I'm multifaceted. I play instruments. I write, I, you know, have a book that's on Amazon, you know, like I, I have multiple different things. That's a part of me, but that's only ever because I started giving myself the liberty to take the time to investigate these different things. And I don't know if it's completely self-care because um, I think like sometimes your hobby can kind of become your work or kind of feels like a work. So it kind of depends on who you are, but just giving yourself time to explore things outside of grad school, I think is really important to develop as a person and to have these conversations and have a more interesting, you know, kind of well-rounded life. 
Yeah, I think you like touched on a really good point. So like mental health or like self-care can be like personal development, definitely Mm -hmm. for sure, because you are like learning more about yourself and you're like more kind, I think, and compassionate towards like Mm -hmm. what you're actually interested in. So yeah, for sure. I would agree with that. Oh, okay. I'm like, not wrong. Yay. (laughs) Uh, It's a a really good way of looking at it. I really like that. Yeah. And I think it's also important, like if you're just starting to kind of switch off from being on grad school all the time to like other things, looking at it as personal development makes it feel more productive. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that's an easier and like, that's kind of how I switched. And now I like read books for fun and puzzle, you know, which are not as productive, which is fine. There's nothing against like not having a productive time, but I think it's easier to switch when you feel like you're doing something productive. It's just not grad school work. Yeah. So I think another way I might think of that is like self-care really isn't a waste of time because it's right. essentially investing in mm-hmm. you. Right. And when I say like investment, that's almost like a loaded term. Um, but I guess that often ties into like the notion of productivity, Um, Mm -hmm. which again, self-care doesn't necessarily have to be about. So again, if you recharge by doing puzzles, which I also find kind of productive or like writing blogs. Um, but for me, I tend to listen to like true crime, like podcasts. Um, so then by all means, like that is self-care and that is again, investing in you definitely like personal development wise. Yeah. And I think it's like investing in your happiness. Mm -hmm. And like, that's something that I feel like as students, we're constantly told that the next thing is going to make us happy. Like all all the time I see people being like, well, when I graduate, I'm going to do this. Or when I'm graduate, like all of this is going to be worth it. And I'm like, but make your life worth it now. (laughs) Like do those things now instead of putting it on hold because you're still alive. And we need to remember that as graduate students, we're, we're sentient beings um, and it, it's not that our life's on hold being in grad school. And so, yeah, I just, I was just saying, like, if you're trying to make the switch and, and aren't willing to spend the time, then you can, you know, but yeah, it, it is about just investing in your happiness and moving forward and whatever makes you happy, you know, working on and doing that and not getting caught up in the competition of who's doing more at grad school or who's doing more in the lab. Absolutely. I think you like succinctly summed up this episode. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's good. Um, So for anyone who kind of wants to find you, um, can you kind of tell them where they could find you? Yeah, absolutely. So I am probably way too active on Twitter. (laughs) Again, academic Twitter. It is fantastic. So I am on Twitter and my Twitter handle is at Karen Tang underscore. So that's K-A-R-E-N-T-A-N-G underscore. And it'll be linked uh, below as well. So um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I think we we had a really good kind of episode and talked about a lot of things. And I think that's, you know, it's so good to talk about mental health in um, grad school and moving forward. And so I'll just kind of give you the floor if you want to say any parting words to end the episode. Uh, so thank you again for having me. Um, this was like, it was a joy to like speak with you and talk about like our struggles with like grad school and like mental health. Um, I think one thing I would keep in mind is like mental health, again, very personalized journey. And again, it's very lifelong. So just keep in mind that it's, our journeys are very, very like different for every one of us. Mm-hmm. So Some of us may be more willing to talk about mental health. Some of us might not be able to, and that's completely okay. Just proceed with um, your mental health journey, however you like, however you're comfortable. Um, I think hopefully like by speaking about it, by talking about it, by blogging about it, um, eventually like we will like destigmatize talking about mental health, even like in like the therapist or psychologist profession. I know there mm-hmm. is a bit of stigma still there. Um, but yeah, essentially like 
try and apply self-care as much as you can to really prevent that point of burnout and talk about mental health um, in ways that are that, that you're most comfortable with like definitely keep that in mind yeah I think that's that's really great advice um, to give uh, I want to let you know that the links to everything we talked about today are available below. And if you want updates on the podcast um, and advice through graduate school, you can sign up for those updates and get my graduate school guide bundle that has a bunch of different cool guides in it. And that will be available at sciencegradschoolcoach.com slash STEMS podcast, which is also going to be in the links below this video. And so to all of you, thank you for watching this episode and I will see you guys in the next episode.